Welcome to the eighth and final Learn Along program of 2020, hosted by Watershed Action Alliance of Southeastern Massachusetts. We invite you to listen and learn about environmental justice issues in the region by watching this video, by visiting watershedaction.org to access the other Learn Along programs, and by attending our upcoming Environmental Justice Conference in March. Today, we hear from the Reverend Betsy Sowers about the controversial Weymouth natural gas compressor. I am the on the Four River Residence Against the Compressor Station board. I am the EJ person, the environmental justice person. Uh, I actually took over for someone who was doing it uh, up through 2015 or 16 and moved to New York State and is now out there uh, cleaning up New York. I'm Minister for Earth Justice at Old Cambridge Baptist Church, um, where I work um, within the church, um, both educating and bringing folks along on uh, climate justice issues and working with the pastor on theological grounding because a lot of a lot of the bad stuff that's happening in in, in the environment and uh, the reasons that uh, you know the earth is becoming unsustainable goes back to kind of some unfortunate theological premises that come from the Judeo-Christian tradition um, and have been reimagined by liberationist and eco-feminist uh, theologians. So we're working on those at church as well as things like the normal things like recycling and being greener and going up to the state house and advocating for public policy that uh, will be different and divesting from fossil fuels and you know the whole shebang. I wanted to mention, because you're a watershed association, that up until 2018, I did not think much about watersheds. And I went to a conference of the Alliance of Baptists, which is um, nationally a, a diverse coalition of Baptists who are the, of the progressive persuasion, theologically and politically. Uh, and Chad Myers was the guest uh, speaker, Bible study leader, preacher. Um, and it's just a fantastic person that anybody who's interested in watersheds and is theologically inclined should um, should look him up. And I'm going to drop some stuff into the chat as I as I go along, um, because he does his whole theme was about watershed discipleship. And it's about how people need part of the reason that things are so bad is that people are not uh, connected to where they live anymore. And uh, and because of that, they don't they don't know how to care for the earth and they don't know how important it is to care for their watershed. So he's he had this whole call for people to be more mindful of their own watershed. In fact, he made us introduce ourselves by what watershed we lived in. And you'd be surprised how many phones came out with people <laughs> Googling like, what watershed they lived in. Um, and uh, just fascinating stuff that he did. We have an we have a really good environmental justice policy in Massachusetts. If you read the last page, it basically says nothing in this policy should be construed to be legally enforceable. So poof, uh, it means nothing. Uh, also, uh, Senator Pacheco just introduced a new bill as a possible solution to the uh, stalemate. Um, as a suggestion uh, to the committee for how to how to resolve this and i'm putting in a link to that as well so you can look at all of those and contact your legislators like as soon as you get off this call <laughs> and contact them every day because uh, and if you have a legislator who is on the conference committee um, contact them directly and that link i sent will tell you who's on it now to the weymouth compressor and uh let's see it's the time i have left uh, I noticed on your website that you had a previous session with Sabrina Davis on the state environmental justice law and policy. So I won't go into that and refer anybody who wasn't at that back to your own website. And I thought it was great that you guys are getting into the nuts and bolts of environmental justice in the Commonwealth. And as I mentioned, the problem is that our state EJ law is not enforceable. In fact, we just had this confirmed in the first federal district court when we took our air quality permit appeal to them um, and they declined the EJ arguments <clears throat> and said outright because your Massachusetts EJ law is not enforceable. So poof, again, it's gone. Uh, I would add to what I didn't see on your website, the uh, federal um, environmental justice law, which would be something for you to look at. Title VI 
of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which should be enforceable and should have stopped this thing from being built and others. Um, but our regulatory agencies kind of chose to ignore it. So if if the existing laws would be enforced, they would have prevented this compressor station because it sits next to environmental justice communities, uh, would prevent the Eastie substation, which is another thing going on right now. Hearings are going on right now. The siting of that, uh, again, next to uh, the Eversource substation, that would be another group for you to have a speaker from um, around environmental justice, because that's in East Boston and affects Chelsea as well. So the history, uh, briefly, because it's six years long, I hope some of you saw the Sunday Globe last Sunday where we finally got spotlight coverage above the fold front page uh, for our uh, six year fight. And I know Dory has the link to that and can get it to you. If you don't have a subscription, you'll hit a payroll, paywall. Um, I can get you a PDF, I can send Dory a PDF for people who uh, can't access the Globe. Um, that was a great story. It was about half of what the uh, guy wrote uh, for space considerations. So it again, it just kind of scratches the surface, but it's a good background. So uh, long story short, six years ago, Alice Arena, who is now the head of FRAX and town councilor Becky Ha, got wind of this plan for then Spectra Energy, which was bought out by Enbridge later. And you may hear Al Algonquin Gas also mentioned when they talk about it. That's kind of the local iteration of Enbridge. So anyway, Alice and uh, Becky uh, were told it's going to be a little like a little garden shed. You won't even notice it. So they did a little research and Becky visited an actual compressor station and they were just horrified uh, about it and uh, started FRAX. Uh, our members are from Weymouth, Quincy, Braintree, Hingham, Hull and beyond. And those cities and towns have joined us in lawsuits at the state and federal level until recently. Our mayor, uh, Headland, signed a host agreement with Enbridge, which is a, another long and unpleasant story, and pulled the town out of um, legal proceedings. But the rest of us are already are still in. Senators Markey and Warren, Representative Lynch have fought with us. The entire South Shore delegation at the, at the State House, bipartisan, uh, have fought with us. The um, Energy Facilities Siting Board at the very get-go recommended against siting the thing at this location. It's too small. They can't even get insurance because it's too, the site is too small. It's in a flood zone adjacent to critical infrastructure like the Four River Bridge, the MWRA sewage pumping station right next to it, uh, densely populated, and of course, two environmental justice communities uh, within a mile and several others within five miles. But Spectra then um, de declined to consider other proffered locations. There were seven locations offered. Um, and MassDEP went ahead, just, you know, rolled over and went ahead with the permitting process. Governor Baker has claimed repeatedly that his hands were tied from acting to stop the project because it's all federal, he said. Uh, but that's a bit disingenuous because, uh, disingenuous because uh, there are state um, permits that are required for this thing to go forward, particularly the, the air and water permits and a consistency review from coastal zone management, any of which could have stopped the project uh, at the state level. Um, so uh, what's a compressor station? Uh, you'll find more about that on our website, the nocompressor.com. There are every 40 to 100 miles along pipelines. Uh, and they push the gas, you know, further, further along. So the gas doesn't slow down. They emit multiple air pollutants and there's noise pollution. And this one being right by the water, if you know anything about uh, noise and water, that water amplifies the sound. So it will be even more noisy to abutters than, uh, than normally. There, um, they also have these uh, blowdowns in which uh, sometimes, uh, for regular maintenance and sometimes because of accidents. And uh, at, when they have a blowdown, tens of thousands of gallons of fracked methane are released just immediately and in, directly into uh, the local air. And nationally, probably about every year and a half, there's a big accident with the compressor station complex. 
So they're usually built in rural areas with 40 to 100 acres because of all these problems. I mean, and that's before you even talk about climate change. Just if you were, if it was just all of the immediate uh, issues around the compressor station, uh, you wouldn't put it in a site uh, like this. In fact, the Weymouth site is the smallest and most densely populated ever in the country for the siting of a project like this. I also want to mention that there's a lot of disinformation about what this gas is for and this frightening, you know, gran granny's going to freeze this winter if we don't build this thing because we need the gas for heating, blah, blah, blah. But this uh, project is called Atlantic Bridge for a reason. It's to export the gas to Europe via Canada, where they're trying to build a big port, LNG, for export. Um, Eversource and National Grid have both said that they don't need this gas to serve Massachusetts. Um, and so the environmental justice communities, to bring it back to EJ, get all the risk and none of the benefits. If you can say, you know, that, that, that maybe heating your home would have been a benefit, but it's not going to heat the homes in Massachusetts. So the Mass Executive Office, Office of Energy and Environmental Affairs map of environmental justice tracks from 2010 census shows that there are two areas in Quincy, that's uh, Quincy Point and Germantown, within uh, one mile of the proposed compressor and additional tracks in Braintree and Weymouth within five, which we mentioned already. And that determination was made on the basis of race, income, and languages other than English. And those are the criteria for designating any EJ community. Uh, and several of those areas meet all three of the criteria. Um, most of the people in the Quincy EJ communities are uh, from China or Southeast Asian countries. And my sense is that these are folks who got priced out of Chinatown and moved you know, as, uh, down to the South shore where, where things were cheaper. So a lot of the folks um, don't speak English or, or don't have uh, you know, a, a fluency in English as well having, as having economic uh, issues. Um, so these communities are already suffering from the toxic effects of historic pollution and current industrial emissions from nine existing other emitters who are right there along the mouth of the Four River and 34,000 plus cars daily that are, use the Four River Bridge in Route 3A. So there are already elevated uh, levels of childhood asthma. There are cancer clusters, I mean, weird cancers, uh, neurological diseases, heart and respiratory disease, well above state averages in these EJ communities. So the maps sh should have triggered mass EJ policy and Title VI of the federal EJ policy to engage at least those two EJ communities in Quincy. But that did not happen. Why? I'm going to focus for time's sake just on the air pollution piece because there's there's more. But um, two points. One was the health impact assessment, which was delayed and flawed. Baker, the Baker administration first refused to do one. And after public pressure, he finally agreed. Then he delayed it for a year and underfunded it. So there wasn't enough time for MAPC, which is the agency that was hired to do a proper health impact ass assessment. So to summarize a long story, in spite of all those shortcomings, MAPC did find significant health issues, um, but then they sent the study to be reviewed by the Executive Office of Energy um, and Environmental Affairs to review it. And in the end, the conclusions that were released didn't match the data. The study ended up concluding that the poor health in the area was due to excessive smoking sedentary lifestyles and recommended that the mitigation should be public education on you know taking people taking better care of their health i mean talk about blaming the victims and that for sure doesn't explain all the childhood cancers and asthma because they're not smoking and living you know living sedentary lifestyles so it was just adding insult to injury um, Boston Physicians for Social Responsibility came out with their own health study, uh, which was just damning and uh, slammed MAPC, at which point MAPC backpedaled uh, and set, came, out, uh, came out publicly in opposition to the project, but not on health grounds. 
not on health grounds. So weird. So the second piece of the air quality uh, issue was, was the air quality permit itself, uh, which uh, was for the DEP to do. And the hearing, I've got to say, I sat through the hearing three days, was right out of Kafka, uh, just a couple of vignettes. Um, the Mass DEP forgot to retrieve the data from half of the air canisters that they had used to measure the pollution um, until after an investigative journalist discovered that omission. And then the DEP ended up dumping over 700 pages of data at the end of the second day of the three-day hearing. And that data had evidence of alarming ev uh, levels of carcinogens like 1,3-butadiene, particulate matter, nitrous oxide, formaldehyde, and others. So what did the DEP do with this evidence? They chose not to consider it. And this is this, if you take only one thing away today, they chose not to consider the baseline pollution in the Four River Basin when permitting the new facility, but only the emissions that would come out of the one facility as if there were no other uh, pollution there. Uh, and then on top of that, they took Enbridge's word for what the emissions would be. They did no, there was no independent uh, measuring uh, or finding out what actually comes out of a compressor. They just took Enbridge's word for what was going to come out of the compressor. And so they concluded, uh, so of course the environmental justice uh, provisions were not triggered because their conclusion was basically that once this thing is running, there'll be less pollution in the air than there actually is already. And you just can't make this stuff up. Um, the key to this all is that they were not required to ignore the baseline pollution, which is, of course, a scientifically bankrupt way to operate. But they were also not required to ignore it. They had a choice. Uh, previous practice in other administrations was to include the baseline uh, pollution. And in 1990, actually, there was a trash incinerator proposed for the area right here, and it was defeated based on the existing pollution, which is already well above limits. So I want to flag for y'all as you engage in EJ going forward, that that is a huge key issue um, to address. And it's one of the reasons I put contacting your legislators about this current climate bill, number one, because that's something you can do right now to try to get this addressed in this legislative session so we don't have to go to the next one. Um, so the, uh, the air quality appeal was, uh, was taken to the federal court. And as I mentioned, they dismissed the EJ arguments. Um, they are still, um, there's still a pending, um, uh, ruling on whether or not Enbridge has to use an electric motor instead of a gas motor to power the thing, the, the compressor station, but not on whether or not it can operate at all. So it's currently the good news not operating and has not operated um, because we just got a, a ruling that uh, they can't they can't start up again until they resolve the causes. The, there's a study going on to resolve the causes of two big accidental gas releases when they tried to start it up in October, which is when they were permitted to do that. Um, other good news is that. Uh, they were supposed to be operational in November of 2017. So it's been three years plus that our public uh, opposition has managed to delay them and all of our lawsuits and our, our actions. So we celebrate every day that that thing's not running uh, is protecting the health of the environmental justice communities and everybody else um, and our climate. Um, there's a lot of other stuff about the, the pollution at the site and the construction. Uh, the site is all coal ash, asbestos bricks, arsenic, uh, fuel oil that was spilled on it. Uh, there used to be a coal plant uh, there where all the coal ash was dumped. And then there was a giant uh, oil tank uh, that leaked tens of thousands of gallons into the ground. So when they were constructing last summer and fall, all of that stuff was going up into the air and being breathed by the people in the EJ communities again. 
Um, I could talk another half hour about safety. Um, evacuating that area would be impossible. You know, if the drawbridge is up, you know, we already know when the drawbridge is up on uh, the Four River Bridge. It's crazy. You know, the, the traffic is nuts. So, um, yeah, it's just, and there's also the possibility of a, a really catastrophic chain reaction because of all of the other emitters and uh, flammable uh, things like a tank farm and uh, uh, there's a palm oil plant right across the river. There's all these other explosive infrastructure places right around. So there could be a massive chain reaction explosion that would take out most of the Four River Basin and be a mass casualty event. Um, and again, of course, affecting the environmental justice communities first and worst. So I see I'm basically out of time. Let me just conclude by saying, you know, what I've said and the Globe story is, is again, just a fraction of what's been going on for six years. But it's clear that environmental justice and public health and safety have taken a backseat in Massachusetts to the desires of polluting industries. They don't even try to ask for siting of these things in well-to-do white communities, but they choose to, conf and, and I've heard Baker say this, they choose to concentrate the pollution in, he doesn't call them sacrifice zones, but that's what they are. You know, put pollution where pollution already is to spare everybody else. He doesn't say that this is at the expense of people of color and low wealth, but that is what structural racism looks like. And in this time of COVID, we know, you know, studies have shown that it's, uh, this Harvard study showed that it's even more deadly because people who uh, are breathing polluted air are much more uh, susceptible to the virus. So uh, pollution and racism have to be dealt with together. Uh, and I wanna end with a, a quote just to, to, that I've come to really appreciate from Hop Hopkins of the Sierra Club in an article called Racism is Killing the Planet, which I'll put in the chat as well. He says, you can't have climate change without sacrifice zones, and you can't have sacrifice zones without expendable people, and you can't have expendable people without racism. So as you are working on environmental justice, I invite you to kind of keep Keep that thought um, in your in your minds ahead because we you can't untangle these fights. <laughs> in the end, it's all about one mindset, uh, about exploiting and using, and uh, you know that that everything everything is an object to be used, and everyone is an object to be used in service of making money. Uh, and political power. And so when you're, when you're dealing with environmental justice um, and protecting your watersheds, um, you know, you're dealing with all of that. So I commend you and thank you for, um, for taking this on. And, and now, if you have any more time, I'll be happy to answer questions. First of all, Betsy, that was incredibly informative. I live not far from where, uh, this is going on. I live in Hull, mm -hmm. and um, and so I have been kind of following along. Uh, so, but my question is, why do you think the DEP didn't use the baseline data, and and why why on earth is the governor supportive of this? I mean, what's the benefit that he is balancing here? Because I didn't hear, you know, it doesn't sound like there is any benefit. So I don't I don't really get it. Uh yeah, you have a great uh, rep, Joan Mes Moschino, who's been fighting with us uh, tooth and nail. Um, yeah, it has been the policy of this administration not to look at. And, and I, I believe it's the federal law now, especially under the, the current administration, that, it, that makes that optional. Um, so Governor Baker... You know, it's his policy and his people uh, in his, you know, his agencies are, we call it regulatory capture. You know, they're, they're, there's this revolving door with the industry. And so there's this, uh, it seems like there's never a, a consideration in all the hearings I've been at 
that a project shouldn't happen. It's all about just mitigate, you know, how do we mitigate the, uh, the impacts of this? The benefits, I think, Baker still is in that debunked place of gas being a bridge fuel. Uh, I saw him speak Oh, actually, probably the first hearing I went to at the state house on on all of this stuff some years ago, um, where he was talking about these maps that they have at the state house, and it has the price of energy, uh, which is oh, actually another thing I could uh, talk about ISO New England and uh, their website, which you can see the you can see the price of energy. Uh, in real time all the time. So if you want to charge your electric car or do your laundry, you can do it when the electric electricity is cheap. But anyway, he his concern was that energy in New England is um, among the most expensive in the country. And that's true. Um, and one way and and from his perspective, that discourages businesses from coming here. Uh, like corporations for coming and, and putting their headquarters here, which brings money to our economy and jobs and blah, blah, blah. Uh, so he still argues that, uh, yeah, we need to transition to clean energy, but gas is this bridge fuel and it's cheap and it brings our prices down and it's good for the economy. That's his argument. We also, our investigative journalist also found out that he gets his campaigns get a lot of a lot of money from fossil fuel companies and the Enbridge's lawyer the firm, the firm that represents them. So, uh, yeah, he, he his campaigns benefit, um, and that that again that whole mindset that, that it's all about the money, it's all about the economy, it's all about growth. You know, in, infinite growth on a finite planet. Um, and I have I have a little compassion for him because in a way that's his job to make sure the economy is healthy and uh, but on the other on the other end, you know, electricity uh, from solar is now way cheaper than anything else. He could have he could have really pushed that and he didn't. And there's still trillions of dollars in subsidies going to fossil fuels globally, which is if they wouldn't be so damn cheap if they weren't subsidized, um, you know. So it's just, it's just very, it's just very frustrating. And uh, I, we, we have no love for Governor Baker. Um, we, and I'm not, you know, as a clergy person, I'm not a partisan person. It's, it's just all about the issues. Uh, he is not our friend on clean energy. I mean, he likes to talk about it. I was on the ISO. There was an ISO New England. Um, tutorial from the AG, the attorney general's office the other day, and they put up side by side graphs of the uh, clean energy transition in the different um, energy regions of the country. And we're in the bottom half. We're in the bottom half. Uh, so yeah, um, you know, he does he does some good things, but um, not nearly as much as as uh, states like California or New York or you know whatever. Um, so we we really need to get on his case uh, because yeah he's he when it when push comes to shove you know I, I was talking about all the people who are working with us. There's one who isn't, and he and he tells the regulatory agencies what to do because they're under him. If you read the Glo if you read that Globe story. Uh, I, I'd actually heard this in real time uh, when the people from, I think it was oh, um, Boston Physicians for Social Responsibility met with Monica Burrell, a state public health person, and uh, briefed her about all the public health issues down here and asked her to go to the governor. And she said, I can't do that. I'm a political appointee. I'll lose my job. So that's the state of environmental justice in Massachusetts. <laughs> well, thank you for that that uh, response, although we didn't like hearing everything that we heard. Are, are there any other questions from the group here? Go ahead and unmute and ask or raise your hand. 
All right. I think that that we're we're good. We so appreciate you coming and speaking with us. You're so knowledgeable. And um, I'm sure there'll be a little bit of follow up if you don't mind receiving emails from sure. folks in the group, especially me. Sure. Super. Yes. Sure. And you got all the stuff in the chat. And in the chat will be in our legislative stuff. And, and, and we'll, put, we'll post it on the learn along too. So many people will right. benefit from this. Right. And I will send you, I'm going to get off and then I'll send you right away that PDF of the Globe article for those nice. who don't have a subscription. Okay. Super. Thank you nice. so much. Nice to meet you all.